Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. Jason Chu. Dr. Chu graduated from the University of California, Davis in 1981 with a B.S. in biochemistry and earned his M.D. at University of California, Davis in 1986. He completed his internal medicine residency at St. Mary's Hospital in San Francisco in 1989 and did his subspecialty training in pulmonary disease and critical care at UCLA, finishing in 1992. Dr. Chu is board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary and critical care, and is a fellow of the American College of Chest Physicians. He has been in practice since 1992. Currently, he is serving as the co-director of Washington Hospital's Respiratory Care Services. I want to go over kind of like a potpourri of uh, lung health and you know respiratory problems from uh, you know our common uh, bronchitis and pneumonia and flu, and then later if we have time to go over some areas that uh, you know want, I want to protect people from uh, other you know environmental or smoke-related uh, lung diseases like lung cancer. This is a uh, picture of just the general population, and uh, every year more than 60,000 uh, Americans. Uh, die of pneumonia, so it's not uh, just a really trivial type of uh, disease that we should, uh, you know, not think of and really be careful with. And this is just a really simple cartoon uh, anatomy diagram of the of the lungs of a healthy person. And I won't go over all the you know lessons in anatomy with you, but uh, basically, you know, we have our lymph nodes which protect us, and then the airways uh, which start from the trachea all the way down to the bronchi and then the alveoli and you know where each um, respiratory infection uh, occurs in that um, in that lung. So um, as a um, clinician you know we want to all take a very good history uh, so that we know you know which patients when they com come to us at the office or in the uh, urgent care or the emergency room you know who uh, is um, you know um, possibly having a, a pneumonia or bronchitis or uh, the uh, flu. So we try to discuss their symptoms and uh, try to be uh, targeted and focused and uh, ask them when their symptoms first began and that can give you a clue. Uh, be very careful in uh, listening to your patients and you know how, how their sputum is and what you know color means you know whether they really have an infection uh, bacterial or viral or just a, a common cold. Um, whether there's any underlying chronic illnesses like COPD or heart disease or diabetes and the health of others at home because uh, I'll give you a slide later and see where the most uh, likely transmission is to occur and then any recent trips people have taken especially around the holidays and being closed and indoors because if you're in the east or the midwest it's been really cold and ma mainly people are just uh, uh, much closer contact and uh, medications uh, that uh, one is currently taking. The symptoms that uh, can occur are uh, pretty generalized. I mean the respiratory symptoms consisting of a cough um, fevers uh, up to 102, the whole gamut, and then ch chills. Uh, when it becomes more severe, patients can complain of shortness of breath, and then their uh, um, other uh, systems become altered, like their heart rate becomes fast, and they get uh, chest discomfort uh, from coughing or breathing so hard. So there's different types of infections that can uh, occur in the uh, respiratory system, bacterial, viral, fungal, and uh, uh, one of the most common is bacterial, uh, and uh, it usually starts, uh, you know, with uh, possibly a virus that weakens uh, someone's immune system, and then it can uh, progress into a, a full-blown bacterial infection in the lungs, and possibly even worse yet, uh, uh, going into the bloodstream and causing a very severe illness. 
And uh, those signs and symptoms of a bacterial infection are usually more severe where patients are, are extremely weakened, uh, chills, fevers, high-grade fevers, uh, chest discomfort from coughing and, and, and breathing difficulties, and then a lot of uh, sputum and uh, phlegm production. Viruses are more common but probably less severe. Uh, although it can progress, and uh, depending on the person's uh, own uh, health status, it can uh, you know, be quite, quite severe. So uh, more than half of the pneumonias are probably virus and viral in nature, and they present like, kind of like an upper respiratory infection, flu-like illness. Uh, like I said, more uh, severe than just the common cold, uh, because uh, it's inside the lungs now, and it makes difficulty breathing instead of just in the throat and the sinuses. Um, and uh, more systemic symptoms could occur like muscle pains, headaches, and as it progresses, uh, then uh, more um, respiratory symptoms develop uh, with uh, coughing and difficulty breathing, and then also running the risk of a pneumonia. The mycoplasmas are uh, less common, but they're like something that uh, we should look out for. It's a type of uh, bacteria that is probably a little less severe than a pneumonia. That's why they call it the walking pneumonia. We've had cases in our hospital amongst our healthcare workers. Respiratory therapists have gotten this just because of the close contact and uh, just, um, just within just uh, air droplet infections away from a cough or a sneeze. And um, these patients are usually not sick enough so they won't stay at home or from work or in bed. So they're just passing this thing merrily along the way as they walk and infect about everyone that they get near to until they've gotten you know, somewhat uh, under control and treated. So it spreads rapidly. It can spread in a college dorm. It can spread in a you know, army barrack, um, a hospital ward. And uh, you may continue to have uh, these symptoms, uh, a persistent cough, which goes on for weeks, maybe. And uh, then eventually, you'll find, well, I should probably go check, see what's going on. Fungal infections are rare still. They're usually from the soil and the dust. We, we live in an area that's pretty windy. And uh, you, know, you can just go to the San Joaquin Valley and get valley fever. And uh, uh, these are usually pretty innocuous and uh, uh, benign conditions unless um, a person has uh, some other underlying medical problems and uh, then they can develop a more severe pneumonia. And then uh, we don't have a lot of this uh, patient population, uh, the AIDS population, uh, but they are more immunocompromised than the normal immunocompetent hosts that, uh, that are the majority and then they get a more severe type of uh, pneumonia called pneumocystis. So what are the causes of uh, pneumonia? Okay, so the, uh, we've talked about the types of bac uh, bacteria, viral, or fungal pneumonias. And what happens is, if you see the, the diagram here, the um, normal lung alveoli is on top, and the uh, one that has pneumonia is on the bottom. So the pneumonia lung is um, crowded with mucus, so it uh, impairs the breathing and the gas exchange. And uh, you're coughing up thick mucus and uh, trying to uh, expectorate it out so you can have more room to breathe. And this is how a, a really bad double pneumonia looks on chest x-ray because uh, they uh, really are crowded and have very little lung capacity and are very impaired and sick and tend to be more often than not in the hospital and maybe even in the ICU. So uh, this is a, a busy slide, but uh, we try to categorize severity of pneumonia in our patients, uh, whether they came from the community, like uh, they're at home or at work, or they've uh, gotten it from a nursing home or in the hospital while they were in for another reason, like a broken hip or you know other uh, medical problems, and then develop a pneumonia while they're in the hospital. That's a more severe type. If they have like uh, aspirated or choked, uh, whether they've had a history of strokes before and they can't control their um, saliva and they, they choke on that, or pneumonia is caused by um, other opportunistic organisms, those are like the AIDS patients with a very weakened immune system, or cancer patients that are on chemotherapy drugs that also weaken your immune system are uh, susceptible to those pneumonias caused by opportunistic uh, infections. And then there's the emerging uh, different types of flus. In years past, we've had the bird flu, and then I'll talk a little about that, and we've had the SARS, which came from Asia, uh, which pretty much uh, impaired the uh, economics uh, during that time where business were really um, slow and uh, afraid to travel. Uh, so when you have a pneumonia, you categorize them as what, what, how old they are. If they're over 60, 65, they may be categorized in a more severe group. Uh, if they have uh, underlying uh, cancer or heart problems, they're in another more severe group. Or if they've got really altered as far as their presentation, they're really uh, 
confused, uh, not making sense, sleepy, uh, worn out, uh, very fast heart rate, very uh, fast breathing rate, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, you know uh, either a very high extreme high temperature or extremely low temperature. Then you would categorize them in a higher group. Then they would get immediate attention, whether they go straight to the emergency room to the hospital and uh, bypass that six hour wait because, you know, the way that the emergency room can get impacted, you have to have a triage system of severity of illness. So the risk factors I've already mentioned, um, older age group, uh, but there's many that are older than 65 still and very healthy, very good um, immune system. Uh, so I don't want to categorize all those, but the majority that have that older age group or the very young are, are, are higher risk factors. If they have certain diseases, if they've been hospitalized recently or have been in the intensive care worse yet, or exposed to chemicals or pollutants at work or around uh, their living environment, and they've had uh, surgeries or experienced previous trauma, those are all higher risk factors. So as a you know, physician, you know, we always uh, make sure that we uh, listen carefully to our patients and then uh, do a careful examination and uh, see if there's anything pattern recognition that we have. And uh, the stethoscope helps a lot, but usually you have to get more than that. You have to get an x-ray. The x-ray shows uh, pretty easy uh, ABCs. A is a pneumonia, B is a normal healthy part of the lung, and C is the heart. And then we order some lab tests, whether it be blood tests, to see if they have an elevated white count, which means that they're trying to fight an infection, or whether they have uh, you know, uh, a chemical imbalance or, uh, you know, their sputum is uh, infected or their uh, blood gas, which is their oxygen and carbon dioxide level, are really impaired. Those things are really uh, important as far as our, you know, figuring out what kind of si uh, situation that they have and how sick they are. And then uh, in our office and also in the hospital, we do pulmonary function tests because a lot of my patients already have underlying lung disease, okay? They, that's already part of their baseline. They have COPD or asthma. So then we measure their spirometry at a baseline, and then when they're sick, you know, how bad are they, how much impaired are they, then we have to use other methods to treat them with inhalers or with steroids or oxygen. So these are another uh, diagnostic test we use, sputum analysis. If they're um, able to give us more than just spit but something deeper in their lungs, we could uh, obtain some specimens and see what type of infection that they have, whether it be looking like this, which are these little beads, these uh, uh, are uh, chains and they're uh, the most common pneumonia called the pneumococcal pneumonia and they have the pneumonia vaccine uh, available as well which is uh, something that's offered um, every five to seven years uh, not like the flu vaccine which is uh, every year and then the complications when you get a pneumonia can be quite severe like I talked about you can get a blood-borne infection which uh, really uh, com completely impairs you as far as uh, your ability to even get out of bed it may affect other organ systems like your kidneys liver heart, and then other complications include uh, fluid that builds up in the side of the lung, which is a pleural effusion, which sometimes requires a tube to drain it, or they can develop uh, tuberculosis. Uh, and tuberculosis is not something that's trivial because of the uh, uh, worldwide travelers that we have coming into California, and there's TB coming from the uh, Asian countries, Mexico, uh, so, and, and some of them are quite resistant to uh, uh, anti-tuberculous medicines. Then another complication is an abscess where pus fills up in the lung and uh, it needs uh, stronger antibiotics or sometimes uh, they need surgery to remove it or uh, a bronchoscopy, which I try not to do because that may infect a greater portion of your lung by spreading it. So it just really needs to be uh, carefully screened like by x-rays or CAT scans. And now treatment, you know, for bacteria we can use antibiotics, but for virus, uh, viral uh, pneumonias, or a viral infections, you really can't because there's no real good antiviral. I will mention one later when we talk about the flu. Uh, you can rest, get plenty of fluid so you don't get dehydrated, and, um, and then uh, hopefully uh, the body recovers slowly. There's over-the-counter medications just to help people feel better, to reduce the fevers like Tylenol or Advil, and uh, aches and pains, uh, same thing, and um, cough like with uh, expectorants or antitussives, uh, commonly used mucinex. Um, and um, Robitussin and uh, things like that. Uh, and then, um, of course, if they're sick enough, the, the hospital is the next place that we have to treat them at the, with the intravenous medicines, antibiotics, oxygen, respiratory treatments. I always like to also say, you know, use a humidifier or moisture. So if you've got a lot of thick, tenacious mucus, you could go into a hot shower, close all the windows, 
shower curtains and raise up the steam and loosen things up. Sometimes it helps uh, somebody feel better when they just loosen up that phlegm. And then uh, pace yourself. Don't overdo it. Uh, plenty of rest. Uh, make sure that you give yourself a lot of leeway. Uh, be patient as a patient. Uh, don't rush going back to work or rush going back to doing your hobbies and activities and exercising. Uh, it may take a week or even a month to get back your energy. A lot of people tend to want, want to bounce back, especially the younger pa patients, and they end up going back to work and then back to the uh, clinic because they just uh, don't have the energy yet. So they have to talk to their doctors when the best time to resume their normal activities is. And I usually tell myself, okay, give the patient at least seven days from the onset of symptoms or at least 24 hours after their symptoms have completely resolved. So I know that's, you know, probably a little bit liberal, but, you know, at least that's some guidelines that some of my patients could take home with them. Okay, so prevention, prevention, prevention. I mean, everyone says, okay, what's the best prevention? You got to get vaccinated. I mean, in fact, most hospitals uh, will not allow a non-vaccinated employee to work at that facility, whether it be here in California or New York, unless they wear a mask for three months. And that's not very fun because you can't really talk and you can't really, you know, do the things that you normally feel easy and comfortable to do. A flu shot uh, prevents the viral uh, influenza and then um, the uh, pneumonia shot will help prevent the pneumonia, but not 100%, uh, maybe 80%. And uh, if you're 55 and older, you can um, get one every five years and thereafter. But after 65, 70 years old, uh, it's probably good for life, the pneumonia vaccine. Uh, of course, uh, everywhere you look at a um, hospital or a, um, even restaurants, I think, uh, you have to really do good uh, sanitary measures. Hand washing often and frequent and thoroughly, like 20, 30 seconds with uh, the uh, proper soaps and uh, use uh, you know, the proper drying methods, or else you can um, re easily transmit it through uh, just hand contact. Of course, if you smoke, quit smoking or don't ever start. Uh, eating healthy fruits and vegetables um, because they're more like antioxidants uh, to help your immune system and uh, it's also very nutritious. Uh, rest uh, and then um, you know exercise either with a group or with a, a class is always helpful. Uh, all these things keep your immune system strong and these are good little techniques that uh, people want to learn about how to better cough. I mean, there's really no perfect way to cough, but definitely protect yourself from others getting infected by staying away as far as possible, like 20 feet, 30 feet, whatever. I know in a crowded room it's hard to do, but uh, it, some people have to wear a mask uh, during uh, their most uh, highly infectious times and cough into a tissue, which is probably the best because I'll show you a slide where all the uh, droplets will go into the tissue. Next best would be your sleeve, but the worst is your, um, is your hands or no protection, just into the open air. Okay, so get plenty of rest, lots of fluids, emphasize that, and do not stop taking your medications too soon because your pneumonia can come back. A lot of people are therapeutic nihilists. I will take medicines for as long as I feel I need to, no more, no less. And it could be one day, it could be two days, or as soon as a little side effect occurs, whether it be GI or otherwise, you stop. Well, that's not helpful for anybody, yourself included, because you'll get a relapse. Uh, so if it's a seven-day course, take the seven days, unless for some reason you really have side effects, then you should contact your, your physician or whoever uh, um, to uh, uh, tell them this is not um, working, I'm having side effects, and then they could uh, try to uh, uh, try a, a different type of antibiotic or medication. Uh, keep your follow-up appointments because whether a test needs to be reviewed with you, because I've seen uh, pneumonias not be pneumonias but be lung cancers or whatever, so you have to be careful. Keep all your follow-up appointments. And these are some, uh, some websites that you can have to look up in uh, pneumonia complications. Uh, that's not um, that readable because some of them are pretty um, non-layman friendly, like the Mayo Clinic proceedings and all that. But I have some good websites from the uh, CDC, which are, which are helpful. So then you can enjoy the outdoors. This was uh, fall pictures. Now the flu. We all know what the flu is, and we all hear about the flu because this is the flu season, right smack dab in the middle of it probably one of the worst years, even though we have 70 degree weather and Minnesota has minus 10 degrees, we have just as many flus as they have and just as many death cases. So why is that? You know, it's just because, you know, if it's in the air, it may just be just as uh, easy transmissible, whatever the climate may be. So this is a typical little cartoon person of, uh, of suffering from a flu. Patient's got a headache, he's got a runny nose, he's got a temperature, he's using his Kleenex, all the different over-the-counter medications. So what is 
the flu. What is influenza? That is the most common type of flu. There's many types of flus, but uh, influenza is the most common, and it's the ones that we see most often. And there's many different strains, and I'll go over the, this year's strain a little later. But uh, it's a mild to severe respiratory illness of sudden onset, like a day, two days, and it just causes a real debilitated feeling in your body. You are um, highly infectious, so you can spread it very easily. And uh, uh, some strains are more virulent or severe than others, and it kills between 30 to 40,000 people in the U.S. every year. And um, the difference uh, between a flu and a common cold is its severity. It's suddenness, it's a swift, and it really hits you hard. You get a headache, really severe muscle aches, uh, probably like you've just been hit by a truck or you just worked out for six hours and your muscles are aching everywhere. Uh, general weakness and latitude, higher fevers, over 102 probably, um, and um, uh, more severe respiratory symptoms. Uh, uh, your cough is more severe, uh, throat uh, sore, and uh, even to the point of difficulty breathing. Uh, the incubation period is between one to four days usually. Uh, so by the time you get sick, uh, you probably are already very highly transmissible to others nearby. Here is a nice graph depicting the uh, seasonality of the flu. I thought it was earlier, but now the CDC and the most recent tracking of this is that it is peaking around now, end of January, early February, and really hits its high point mid middle of next month, and then starts to wane and decrease by mid-March and early April. This is how a nice visual uh, showing of how it's uh, uh, transmitted to the next person. Uh, a, a very hard, vigorous sneeze or a cough, um, and these airborne droplets are spread uh, probably within a 20, 15, 20 foot radius. Uh, it can happen just when talking, not just sneezing or coughing uh, or touching. So you could touch the surface of a table and the next person will touch that surface or passing you know, something to another person can be a, a form of contaminating it. Um, and here's a good slide that I like to use because I, this is what I share with my patients. So the most common exposure is adult to adult. So as you can see in blue, it's 22.4. So that's the common workplace because you're in a closed environment and you are continually in contact you know, quite uh, many hours of the day. Then the next is probably children to children, the younger age children, probably elementary school. And they're in close contact, especially in the winter. Uh, and uh, they can uh, pass it on because they don't protect themselves. They don't use like a handkerchief or a, a Kleenex. You know, they'll just cough into their hand and they use their hands and wipe their eyes and everything. Uh, and then uh, the next most common uh, uh, transmission is from a child to an adult. So a child coming home from school, bringing it to their parents. And then after that, it's probably teenagers to teenagers because their immune system is a little better. So that's about 10.4. And then a teenage uh, kid to their, to their parent uh, when they go home. But interestingly enough, seniors to seniors or seniors to children, seniors to uh, fellow seniors is low because of um, one, uh, probably not being as exposed and probably in a larger, you know, uh, uh, space distribution. Uh, you know, even in the senior center, the community center. They try to tell you to stay away from the community center when you have a cold or a flu. Okay, so this is a picture of a virus. It's a uh, Outside of it where the green arrows are is where the attachment occurs. That's the uh, protein and the, um, the attachment uh, site to the uh, normal host cell. So when one of these viruses come, they cannot live by themselves. So if a virus drops uh, without infecting a host like a human being, they die because they need to replicate uh, their um, RNA machinery into another cell that has DNA. So, um, you know, uh, that's why close contact enabling these uh, viruses to attach is what's uh, the most uh, severe consequence. And there's so many types of uh, flus now. There's the bird flu, mad cow, deer tick, monkey pox. So what's next? So back uh, five, ten years ago, I think we were really uh, worried about the bird flu. Uh, in fact, it was a, a worldwide distribution of poultry, uh, but it was really the wild birds that were flying across continents that were infecting other continents and not people to people. So there was very few human to human contact. It was mostly uh, birds that were infecting other birds and humans. And then if you work at a poultry area, then you're at the greatest risk. And it was mostly in Asia, as you can tell from this uh, globe, uh, and then uh, less uh, in the uh, North and South America, unless uh, people traveled from there or people went from uh, Asia to uh, North America. 
And this is kind of like the animal vectors or the carriers of the virus. So the uh, human is the last corner one on the left, and they can get infected from uh, uh, poultry, birds, chickens. Uh, they can get infected by the pig, you know, even uh, other mammals. And uh, it's all different types of strains. So as I was saying this year, we're seeing more H3N2 and H1N1. And uh, the vaccines are usually the quadvalent vaccine, so you get protected if you get the vaccines for both uh, strains. So this is a cartoon of Noah's Ark about um, getting rid of all the birds. And then uh, poor Duck here, he's uh, not doing well. Now I want to uh, explain the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic for anyone who uh, you know, may not totally understand the difference. An epidemic is already bad enough. That's a serious outbreak in a single community or region. Uh, which we're seeing. And then a pandemic is worse. It's the epidemic that spreads around the world and affects more than thousands of people across many countries. And there's no protection yet because it's a novel strain. So there's, there's frantic over how to you know, constitute a vaccine to protect the patients. And then they may just have to you know, learn about it the following subsequent years. Uh, so a pandemic that results from influenza virus strain that humans have not been previously exposed to so I'll just give you just a little um, gravity of the situation. Back in 2001, when the terrorist attack occurred, five people died from the anthrax in envelopes that were put in people's mail. So wow, that was a, a, a terror, and everyone was frightened out of their wits. They wouldn't even open their mailbox. Um, then there was the Nile, West Nile virus that killed 284 people in Asley, so everyone was worried about standing water and everything like that. And then the SARS outbreak. Uh, back 10 years ago uh, in Asia, where uh, a lot of the um, people were getting the uh, SARS virus, and it caused a respiratory infection so bad that 800 people died and it froze the Asian economy and uh, frightened millions of people from even traveling there. So no one wanted to even go to the countries where there were these outbreaks. And it took almost a year before that kind of quieted down. But Historically, that compels, those things pale in comparison to just the simple flu. Like in 68, 69, there was a worldwide uh, pandemic of 700,000 deaths, 34,000 in the U.S. And then more recently, I mean, uh, more remote was 57, 58, when there was 1.5 million deaths and 70,000 in the U.S. And the worst flu recorded in uh, human history was in 1918, the Spanish flu, where 50 million people died worldwide and 500 to 650,000 died in the U.S. And our typical influenza season, 36,000 die in the, in the, in the U.S. And uh, we've had quite a few uh, already in just our, in our county uh, this early season in January. Uh, I think there's 30 deaths or 35 deaths now. So the antiviral medications that I mentioned are maybe po possibly effective, but you have to catch them early. I've only used about two or three um, uh, prescriptions of the Tamiflu this year because I caught them early, like 48 hours, where they came in right away from work or you know, um, wherever they were, and I said, oh, you, you have it, and I think we'll start you on Tamiflu because they didn't get the vaccine. So it's not a preventative or a prophylaxis, but a treatment if caught early. It inhibits the uh, attachment of the virus to the host and uh, renders it uh, ineffective, and uh, it's uh, a treatment for um, 10 days. Uh, yeah, 75 milligrams, two tablets twice a day. And they are in short supply. So I know if the prescriptions are written by your physician, sometimes some of the pharmacies may not carry them even because of this you know, rampant scare. Sometimes people are getting it even if they don't have it because they don't want to miss it. Uh, so uh, if they are short in supply, that's probably the reason. So still the best methodology is be a germ stopper. Vaccination is critical. Stay at home when sick. Cover your uh, cough effectively. Wash your hands thoroughly and avoid touching the mouth, eyes, and nose. And avoid contact uh, with uh, people who are sick. And uh, you can wear gloves. You can use uh, hand sanitizers. Um, you know, even bleach on some of the cleaning environments on tabletops and stuff like that. And this is a um, hand washing. And this is a, a, an interesting slide that I found on um, one of the um, articles that I was reading that you can miss a lot of your hand by just washing superficially for five or 10 seconds. You miss the webbing of your hand. You miss some of the uh, other critical spots. So just wash your hands as if you were going to perform surgery. You ever see the surgeons? They wash their hands. They scrub their hands. They're standing in front of the sink for about 30 seconds. And that's uh, going to cover the most frequently missed areas. 
And a lot of people put these all over the place. They put them on your, um, you know, your countertops. You put them on your uh, uh, glove compartment in your car, your pocket, your purse, because they are effective. Almost every time you touch something, you may as well just do a, a little uh, Purell on your hand. And the uh, financial impact on um, the flu is pretty severe. If you've just been sick seven to 10 days, this is a Harvard study, public health study, uh, published about six years ago. Uh, if you have a lower income earning, uh, you're about 56% uh, affected. And as you get uh, higher in income, of course, you can uh, tolerate that financial burden better. But if you've been absent for a month or three months, uh, you know, the whole thing, um, w whether you're a uh, high income earner or low income earner, will impact you financially. So the swine flu. What do we know about the swine flu, the H1N1? It's a novel uh, flu, you know, but it's not that novel anymore because we saw it in 2009. It spread from person to person, so not by pig to person when you eat pork. The United States government has declared it a public health emergency now and back in 2009. I don't know why it skipped three years. Um, CDC response goals are to reduce transmission and illness severity and provide the um, information. Uh, that can help uh, healthcare providers. That was the problem, I think, in 2009. There wasn't enough awareness and there was more public, uh, I mean, more uh, people that were crowding in, in environments that they didn't have um, access to and then um, it became more chaotic. The first case was back in 2009 after that 25 year lag period um, and in Texas. And it has spread rapidly and, uh, and internationally as well. The CDC expects more cases before the season's over, more hospitalizations and more deaths from this outbreak uh, in the coming days and months. Uh, influenza is already serious enough, but this is even more serious as far as uh, severity of illness. And these are the signs and symptoms of the H1N1 flu. It's very similar to our seasonal flu uh, with the fever, the cough, uh, the sore throat, runny nose, body aches, headaches, chills, fatigue. But in addition, there's more GI symptoms like vomiting, diarrhea, and some people will say, well, is it just because I ate something or is it because the antibiotics is disagreeing with my stomach? Certainly, but sometimes they haven't even been started on antibiotics yet and their appetite is so poor that you have to start thinking of the H1N1 that is the cause of the uh, GI symptoms. And it's higher than your regular flu. And it's spread just like any other virus. Uh, it's spread through airborne droplet contact, uh, through coughing, sneezing, talking, touching any respiratory parts and then um, just infecting the areas that uh, your hands may get in contact with. Uh, it is um, formally referred to as a swine flu, but no one calls it that anymore because people got the misconception that you spread it by eating pork. And you cannot get this uh, from eating pork. Or even from, you know, well, I mean, you want to handle your pork and eat it, you know, when it's, you know, not, not uncooked or something, but that's not how you uh, get it. And I can't help but emphasize the hand washing and the alcohol-based hand sanitizers enough and the uh, protective mechanisms. And uh, like I said uh, earlier, if you are sick, stay home at least, or at least try to avoid contact for seven days after your symptoms first began and um, 24 hours after you've uh, felt back to your baseline. And that's hard to say, you know, what your baseline is because you've been pretty sick even before and uh, it, it may take uh, more than 24 hours. Uh, so limit your contact with other people as much as possible, common sense. And what are the emergencies? Because this is when you want to be preventative and not get to the situation. So in adults, you want to um, forewarn them about any difficulty breathing whatsoever, especially the lungers, you know, people with COPD or asthma. Difficulty breathing, using their inhalers more, increasing their oxygen, um, pain in their chest, pressure in their chest, abdomen, uh, very dizzy, lightheaded, confused, altered mental status, and um, you know, like I said, the vomiting. Flu-like symptoms, but they get back. They may improve after a day or two, maybe with Tylenol or Advil, but then they go right back. And if that returns or worsens, then that's a sign for a more severe situation. And for children, which I don't see, but I pulled this up because you know, there's a concern with the, uh, the younger age group, fast breathing and trouble breathing, blue or gray skin color, not drinking enough, vomiting, not waking up or interacting, irritable, and then uh, flu-like symptoms improve but then return, just like in an adult. So in summary, 
The CDC anticipates that there will be more cases, more hospitalizations, and more deaths associated with this virus. And um, there is immunity to it now. We have the vaccine. We must work together to control it better so that it's not going to be uh, a public health, uh, you know, real nightmare like it was in 2009. And uh, these are the websites. The CDC website is a very good one. And, um, you know, we're all working in concert together, um, you know, in the, in the hospital and in the clinics and also in the public health arena. I don't um, want to spend a whole lot of time on this because, you know, obviously this is like the far end of the spectrum, the sickest of the sick. Patients that have really severe lung disease, um, you know, developing into lung cancer. And um, lung cancer is the leading cause of death for men and women as far as cancer deaths are concerned, and it's not going down. You know, other forms of death are going down with uh, early detection, uh, whether it be breast cancer, uh, but uh, lung cancer is usually not um, easily early detected. It is also the most preventable form of cancer because 90% or so are self-induced from cigarette smoking. And tobacco use accounts for about 87% of that. And there are two major types, uh, and I'm not going to belabor the differentiation for that for you guys, got, because there's the small cell type and the non-small cell type, and they grow differently. Now, cigarette smoking is by far the greatest risk for lung cancer. The longer a person ex exposed to it, whether they smoke it uh, directly or secondhand, and the more uh, amount they smoke, the greater the risk. And if the person quits before uh, cancer develops, the damaged lung will have an opportunity to gradually improve. They say like 10 years, 15 years. Um, but they Im immediately feel better. I mean, I want to put a plug in for smoking cessation because not only do you prevent lung disease down the road, like lung cancer or emphysema, but you actually improve your quality of life and your exercise and your energy level almost instantaneously. Like I've heard people that quit smoking by the next day or the day after, they're able to do you know, far more than they did during the time that they smoked. So non-smokers who breathe in secondhand smoke are also at risk, like spouse, coworkers. And then occupation is a, a very common way of getting it, uh, whether it be in the workplace with the chemicals and the environment, or even in your own home, like asbestos used to be in homes, radon, certain metals, air pollution. We've had such poor air quality this past winter. It's probably the worst it's been in decades because of the um, you know, no rain and no wind and, and just, just being socked in. And that's why people are getting sick, even though the weather has been uh, warm and nice. The risk is greatly increased. So there's 215,000 new cases of lung cancer diagnosed uh, annually and about 168, uh, 1%, uh, 161,000 deaths. So it's a high incidence to death ratio. So if you're diagnosed, there's a high number that don't uh, survive. So of course, quitting tobacco is the best way uh, to uh, avoid that and best to not even start. Uh, other ways to reduce your risk include uh, avoid secondhand smoke. They're making laws in you know, certain public places now all over, um, restaurants, airplanes, movie theaters. So eat um, healthy, just like to prevent pneumonias and bronchitis and the flu, exercise and uh, protective measures at work, wearing masks if you're in a you know, really highly uh, polluted uh, work environment, and monitor your radon levels at the home. So the symptoms of lung cancer are not too different than the symptoms of bronchitis, right? Because you guys just saw that last uh, presentation. So the lung cancer symptoms may include this persistent cough. And I've had so many patients just ignore that or just uh, suppress it, just say, I'm getting old or, you know, uh, out of shape. And, uh, and then their sputum starts to have a different uh, uh, nature to it. They may even have a blood streak uh, uh, sputum because of the um, breaking of the capillaries in your alveoli. And then they could have chest pain, voice change, and recurrent pneumonia. Like I've had a, a number of cases where I get referred because the patient's pneumonia is not clearing up. Finally, I go, get an, a, a CAT scan and it's like a big tumor mass and then biopsy that and it's cancer instead of a, a pneumonia uh, or TB. So you have to be um, very careful in, in following these patients. Follow up is very important. And detection. Unfortunately, cancer sometimes is detected too late because it's already spread by the time the x-ray is obtained or the CT scan. So when lung cancer is diagnosed early, it is usually because of a test for an unrelated condition because they had something else go on, whether it be a bronchitis or pneumonia. If lung cancer is suspected, of course, get all the tests that you can, x-rays, sputum tests, even a biopsy. And treatment is most successful when it's caught early. Two or more treatment methods are used. 
patients should thoroughly discuss those treatment options with their doctors because they have all side effects, whether it be chemo or, um, or radiation. So the best way is still surgery if their lung function is strong enough to tolerate uh, the anesthesia and the, uh, the, the surgery itself and not risk them having a pneumonia or respiratory impairments there on end. And then there's uh, alternative uh, treatments like radiation if uh, their condition is too uh, debilitated to undergo uh, surgery. And then uh, chemotherapy if it's spread. Uh, and um, you know, there are different forms now. And of recent note is that there's been a cluster of uh, more uh, Asian women uh, in their, again, 50s and 60s, 70s, that are getting these types of lung cancers that are non-smoking related. And it's called EGRF, uh, endothelial growth receptor factor. It's a mutation that has occurred. And I've seen about five or six cases. And it's very un un uncommon, but we're just seeing it more in that cluster of people. And I know there's um, that, that concern of uh, non-smoking Asian females that they should be tested. Treatment options depend on the cancer type and the stage of cancer. So if you um, localize the cancer early, like stage one, small, they have a very good or much better five-year survival rate of 49% because it's within the domains that the, the surgeon can uh, resect it and not have it had spread to any of the lymph nodes. And basically, um, follow-up is good. And then um, you, know, you have a much better outcome. But unfortunately, only 16% of the lung cancers are diagnosed at that early stage. So the more curative stage is the least diagnosed stage. Why? Because they don't have symptoms or because they suppress their symptoms or deny their symptoms and it's caught late and because of the spread, we're beyond stage one. The five-year overall survival rate is only 15%, all comers, which means you know, they're caught in a later stage. And uh, it doesn't mean that they're cured of cancer, it just that means they're alive and either still going, uh, undergoing treatment or, or kind of in a remission state, if you will. So the five-year window, like you look at in other forms of cancer, doesn't really apply that well to lung cancer. Like you said, you beat cancer if you beat the five-year like odds ratio. But you always have it in the back of your mind. You should be monitored and have surveillance, you know, even beyond the five years. How will cancer affect me and my family? Well, from the time of diagnosis, everyone is affected in any type of cancer. I'm just using lung cancer as a, uh, as a, as a form of, you know, where the uh, cancer society works to, uh, you know, involve the others in the family, the, uh, the, you know, so that there's a support group. Uh, and that, uh, they're, they're, that they're open to discuss it, and if there's any um, impact, whether it be spiritual, financial, um, you know, just their ability to tolerate um, the, the whole realm of, of the cancer itself. Because the patients and their families will be concerned about many things, not just the cancer and, you know, what the ultimate outcome is going to be, but, you know, how are they going to fare while they're either undergoing treatment or, you know, if they've decided not to undergo treatment because of the you know, the other uh, side effects that it involves, you know, there's the um, concerns of, uh, you know, their appearance, their weight loss, their, their pain tolerance, uh, you know, will they be able to sleep, you know, their depression level. So all those factors are global in concerning uh, care of a, of a lung cancer patient. So in recent years, the quality of life for those who are living with cancer has received increased attention. Not just the cancer itself, but the quality of life, the family support. No one has to make cancer journey alone. The American Cancer Society provides sources of information and support to these patients, and there's excellent support groups. There's people that have survived cancer and become advocates or like, um, like a person to uh, you know, really go and have uh, discussions with, so they, they, they've been through it. You know, they can either open themselves up to you through uh, you know, um, support groups or do it online. And th there's a network to connect with uh, others on the American Cancer Society website. And uh, the hope for the future is really to control tobacco use, you know, um, all these, um, you know, methods that people are trying from the electronic cigarettes to the pads to the gum to Chantix, you know, all have some role, all have their um, side effects. Um, you know, they're, they're not 100% proven, but they do help people quit. And how to prevent young people from starting is the key, and that will uh, help prevent lung cancer uh, in those high-risk patients in the future. So there's also new research coming out, you know, as far as scanning earlier, like in uh, some uh, other countries like Japan, they're scanning, uh, CT scanning all patients, I think over 40 or over 50 that have smoked 20 or plus years, 
and maybe detecting it at stage one earlier. Um, we don't have the resources because there's socialized medicine there to do it at that um, frequency, but um, there hasn't been that study shown yet uh, from any of the major institutions looking at is there early screening like they do for pap smears and they do for uh, other uh, cancer screenings like colonoscopies, et cetera. Uh, but there are uh, newer chemotherapy drugs and drug combinations available and even gene therapy as I was talking about with those mutations. But the bottom line is the number of Americans who get lung cancer is decreasing, thankfully, primarily due to the decrease in adult tobacco use over the past 30 years. But unfortunately, the teenagers and the preteens are still increasing in their um, smoking uh, you know, frequency. There's 45 plus million that uh, are current smokers, 21% of the population. And until tobacco use is decreased or you know, curtailed, uh, it will still be the number one cause of cancer death just because the amount and the, um, the severity of it. Uh, and supporting the use of tobacco could nearly wipe out lung cancer. So preventing strategies in the young people are to like increase costs, of course, because they aren't working yet or have a small income, and then uh, reducing access to it, uh, and then reducing the marketing campaign or fighting against the marketing campaign, like the Philip Morrises and all that. Uh, additional ways to decrease tobacco use is a, a supportive, comprehensive state tobacco control program and strengthening smoking bans and restrictions by smoking clean indoor air campaigns and help smokers quit. Because I know a lot of my patients are ex-smokers and uh, they've been really um, some of my best uh, advocates, whether it be in the better breathers or um, you know, uh, you know, support groups that they uh, belong to. And uh, unfortunately, some of them aren't here, but I know that they've been champions of that. So this is the uh, website for the um, cancer organization that have these support groups and some other additional uh, resources. You can always contact them or contact me afterwards. Well, thank you thank for you. all coming. Uh, great audience.